Hey, what's happening, everybody? Back once again with some exegetical reading of Slavoj Zizek's For They Know Not What They Do. This afternoon, uh, the homie Jordan from Theory Underground joined me, and we embarked on Chapter 2. Uh, it was super-duper cool. I'm super-duper appreciative. Jordan, thanks for your time, man. Um, definitely looking forward to next time, and hopefully Max, you'll be able to make it. Um, it was super cool. You guys don't know what you're missing out on. Uh, this is awesome. This is really cool. This text can be uh, a bit intimidating. Um, and it's it's easier to deal with that intimidation when you have a support system. So thank you so much for your time, Jordan. Uh, looking forward to next time. And, uh, and yeah. So anyway, uh, we'll just jump right in. We started reading chapter two. We read the first three or four sections of chapter two. Um, we spent some time... Uh, discussing some some concepts in the book. We spent some time uh, discussing some ideas that are outside the book, but that we felt were pertinent uh, or in somehow related to this text. So anyway, jump in, buckle up, hang on for the ride. Here we go. Thanks, guys. See you soon. This is going to... I don't know where that's going to go, but I'll find it on my hard drive when we're all done. <laughs> all right. So we'll, I guess we'll just jump right into it. Uh, page 61, the wanton identity. Hegel's monism, the doxa on Hegel against which the whole of our interpretation is directed, a doxa which is today a commonplace on all all sides of philosophical spectrum from Adorno to post-structuralism reads as follows. It is true that Hegel asserts the right of the particular that, what is that? So that is, so to speak, opens the door to its wealth and conceives the network of differences as something inherent to the universal notion as resulting from the self articulation of its imminent content. Yet it is precisely through this operation that the phenomenal exterior is reduced to the self-mediation of the inner notion. All differences are sublated in advance insofar as they are posited as ideal moments of the notion's mediated identity within itself. The logic involved here is, of course, that of the fetishistic disavowal conveyed, conveyed by the formula Je sais bien, mais quand même, I know very well that Hegel asserts difference and negativity, nevertheless, by means of the notion's self relation, this negativity is ultimately reduced to an abstract moment of the identity's self differentiation. What lies behind this disavowal is the fear of absolute knowledge as a monster threatening to suppress all particular contingent content in the self-mediation of the absolute idea and thus to swallow our most intimate freedom and unique individuality of fear which acquires the form of the well-known paradox of the prohibition of the impossible absolute knowledge is impossible and attainable an attainable ideal of philosoph a philosophical pipe dream and it is precisely for that reason we must fight its temptation in short Absolute knowledge is the real of its critics. The construction of an impossible, untenable theoretical position, which these critics must presuppose in order to define their own position by distancing themselves from it, by asserting, for example, the positivity of the effective life process, irreducible to the notion's logical movement. The enigma is... Why do the critics of Hegel need this adversary of straw to establish their position? What renders it even stranger is the fact that most of Hegel's defenders with a kind of bad conscience also tacitly accept the need to distance themselves from the monster of all swallowing idea and attempt to save Hegel by timidly asserting that in fact, Hegel does admit a relative autonomy of the particular and does not simply abolish all differences in the unity of the idea. They usually take refuge in the notorious formula of identity of identity and non-identity, which incidentally is more Schillingian than Hegelian. <clears throat> 
What escapes Hegel's critics as well as such defenders is the crucial fact that Hegel subverts monism by paradoxically affirming it far more radically than his critics dare to suspect. That is to say, the usual idea of the dialectical process runs as follows. There is a split, a dispersion of the original unity, the particular takes over the universal, but when the disintegration reaches its utmost, it reverses into its opposite. The idea succeeds in recollecting, internalizing, ver inern, all the wealth of particular determinations and thus reconciles the opposites. At this point, the critics are quick to add that this sublation, Aufhebung, of the external contingent determinations never turns out without a certain remainder. That there's always a certain leftover which resists the dialectical sublation internal, internalization while being at the same time the condition of its possibility. In other words, what the dialectical movement cannot account for is a certain excess, which is simultaneously the condition of its possibility and of its impossibility. So that's like the remainder. Yes, yes. Um, I think this is actually a good place to stop because I feel like in so far, um, Zizek has given us a summary of his uh, Hegel's critics conception of of Hegel's dialectic um, or you know his uh, dialectic of monism and I guess the way I more or less interpreted it was uh, you know critics he critics of Hegel will concede that Hegel's dialectic does have room for difference but at the end of the day, this difference is incorporated back into the universal uh, notion. Um, and so it's kind of a, 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 uh, a false, um, it, it's, it's a mere semblance of, of allowing for difference, but substantively difference is, is not uh, a possibility in Hegel's system, according to his critics. Right. When, yeah, because they don't account for the remainder because they, they take the simplistic thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and that means. Every, everything is, is accounted for. Everything is kind of folded in to, into the one. Um, and uh, Zizek obviously is going to disagree by agreeing with them. <laughs> Right. Um, in the next uh, section of this, uh, or the the remainder, the remainder of this, um, there this we go. first section of Hegel's monism. So um, I can I can uh, take over from reading the rest of this section. Awesome. Okay. What is wrong with this criticism? The key to it is offered by the grammar in Hegel's use of tense. The final moment of the dialectical process, the sublation of the difference, does not consist in the act of its sublation, but in the experience of how the difference was always already sublated, of how, in a way, it never effectively existed. The dialectical sublation is thus always a kind of retroactive unmaking, uh, an ungeschen maschen, a uh, uh, can't, can't pronounce German uh, at all. Uh, anyway, the point is not to overcome the obstacle to unity, but to experience how the obstacle never was one, how the appearance of an obstacle was due only to our raw, finite perspective. Uh, we could trace this paradoxical logic back to Hegel's particular analyses, to his treatment of crime and punishment, in the philosophy of law, for example, the aim of punishment is not to reestablish the balance by recompensing for the crime, but to assert how, in a radical ontological sense, the crime did not exist at all. That is, does not possess fully, or does not possess full effectivity by means of the punishment. Crime is not externally abolished. It is rather posited as something that is already in itself ontologically null. Brought to its extreme, the logic of punishment in Hegel reads, ontologically, crime does not exist. It is nothing but a null and void semblance. 
and it is precisely for this reason that it must be punished. Uh, and I think this might be a, a good because there's a we just there's a lot there, so it might be a, a good place to stop again. Yeah, and that so I get tripped up with that because I want to go back to like the inversion, like law as a crime in itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I'm, I think that's where I'm at, but then like it never existed and it's null and void. I I think that kind of throws me a little bit. Yeah. I guess the, the way I interpreted it was that um, Hegel, uh, the critics of Hegel um, um, accuse, him, accuse him of being a monist. And then what they also do is accuse his dialectic of being teleological. In other words, it starts in one place and that one place determines where it's going to go. And I think what Zizek wants to do is emphasize how the dialectic of Hegel's monism is, is instead retroactive. Right. Okay. And so at the end of the dialectic difference is not incorporated into the universal notion as his critics contend, uh, rather, there is a retroactive recognition that difference had been incorporated into the universal notion from the start. All along. All along. So it's okay. kind of at, there's a, there is a pers uh, perspectival change uh, at the, at the end of the, the dialectic um, that, that, that in, in in essence the 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 uh the end determined the be the beginning yeah um and so i think that's what zizek is trying to emphasize is how he hegel's critics do not recognize that his dialectic is 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 retroactive rather than teleological i think right. that's what he's trying to get at there no, yeah and i think that that makes a lot more sense when taking that in consideration. Cause I, I think that, I think that's the key, that retroactivity, that's the key concept that mm -hmm. like when you're walking around a week later and everything clicks into place, yes, <laughs> then it goes back and it, it made sense all along. You just had to shift your perspective. Yeah. Um, and I feel like the 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 retroactivity at least gives a little bit more space to contingency in Hegel's dialectic. I, I without it, I think you Hegel uh, Hegel's critics would be right that there is no room for difference. There is no room for contingency. But the retroactivity is what is what provides the space for that that. For, for freedom, for, for some kind of contingency. Yeah. Rather than, rather than things being just so it's, mm -hmm. it's that things have always been like, yeah, it's yeah. Um, and then he brings in the, 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 he, he's trying to bring in the example of, of, of law as being universal crime and to be honest, I, I don't, I don't exactly understand how, how that fits into Zizek's emphasis on, on Hegel's um, dialectic being retroactive, but it, it must figure in somehow. Yeah, I, th I think that's kind of what what got me too but um i'm sure there'll be a quilting point that we're coming up to i hope so <laughs> um but uh okay we'll uh, continue on
at this point, we can already locate the first misunderstanding of the Derridian deconstructive reading of Hegel. It breaks down an open door. That is to say, Derrida points out the basic paradox of the argument of the metaphysics of presence when faced with phenomena which have the status of supplement and are exemplified by writing. The recurrence of mutually exclusive arguments on the pattern of the Freudian joke about the borrowed pan. I didn't borrow any pan from you. The pan was already broken when I got it. Writing is totally external to the inner presence of meaning. It simply does not concern its constitution. Writing is extremely dangerous insofar as it threatens to obscure the intelligibility of the intention of meaning. Yet, Hegel paradox paradoxically, and in a way which is unthinkable for Derrida, openly assumes both these propositions. That which functions within the traditional metaphysics as a symptom, a slip to be unearthed by the hard labor of deconstructive reading, is with Hegel the very, very fundamental and explicit thesis. One has to fight crime, for example, precisely because it has no ontological consistency. <sighs> uh, that that paragraph I uh, I struggled with um, a bit, uh, perhaps because I, I do not have too much familiarity with Derrida. Um, Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't like when he keeps going back to crime and leaves it kind of open-ended. Cuz again, that brings that brings me back to like wanting to just think about you know the the inversion and and uh law as as universal crime and stuff like that but that's not what he's talking about here he's talking about something else and it's just mingling in my mind yeah yeah i mean the only thing i'm i'm really able to take away from this paragraph is that Whatever Derrida is doing in deconstruction, Hegel already was doing. And rather than Derrida thinking he's, he's somehow going against the grain um, with deconstruction, Hegel assumes that this this is actually the this is the normal way to understand phenomena and and um and and to think rather than deconstruction being in i i, I, I to bring in your mirror example derrida thinks he's somehow doing an inversion and hegel assumes that that there's uh, I'm to, it, you know it, what i'm it's already at? It's already it's already a part of the formula for yes. coming coming to uh, not base reality, but but to coming to correct assumptions or or, or correct conclusions. That deconstruction yes. is already there, and so Derrida thinks he's taking it further when in reality he's missing half of the equation. Yeah. Um... But again, you know, that's that's really as far as I can go with trying to mine, uh, the, you know, the the meanings uh, of this passage. I am I am curious about um, the Freudian joke about the borrowed um, borrowed pan and the, the it was already pan. broken when you gave it to me. Yeah, um, that's in something else. That joke that's in. I don't know what it is now, but that. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't borrow I, any pan from you. The pan was already broken when I got it. Was that just gaslighting? I mean, I guess I could think of it as being...
I guess it's it's kind of a, a thing where you know um, the the effect trying to determine uh, the the cause the you could think about about it um, um, as may, maybe an example of 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 trying to uh, ups, uh, assert assign a, a kind of retroactivity that that uh, maybe goes okay. into the absurd where it's like. Um, uh, by, by asserting these mutually exclusive um, explanations for why the pan is broken um, the, pa the pan is broken but you're, you're, you're changing the, the reasons for why uh, it, it, it broke I guess and so I don't, but there's, there's something there. I'd be, I'd be interested in, in trying to, I, f I feel like if I thought on it a little bit, I could, I could, I could, I would be able to parse something from that, but. Yeah. Something retroactively changing facts rather than changing perspective or interpretation, trying to, trying to change facts and conditions. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, I think beyond that, I, I don't really have anything else about that, that, that uh that part that opaque paragraph no, we'll leave that to mikey to yeah figure out <laughs> um all right we'll go the silent weaving of the spirit the crucial feature of this dialectical retroactive unmaking is the interval separating the process of the change of contents from the formal closing act the structural necessity of the delay of the latter over the former. In a way, the dialectical process, things happen before they effectively happen. All is already decided. The game is over before we are able to take cognizance of it so that the final word of reconciliation is purely formal act, a simple stating of what has already taken place. I like that a lot. Uh, perhaps the subtlest example of this interval is Hegel's treatment of the struggle of the enlightenment with the superstition and the phenomenology of spirit, where he speaks of the silent, ceaseless weaving of the spirit and the simple inwardness of its substance, which, incomparable to a silent expansion or to the diffusion, say, of a perfume in, perfume, geez, in the unresisting atmosphere, it is a penetrating infection which does not make itself noticeable beforehand as something opposed to the indifferent element into which it insinuates itself and therefore cannot be warded off. Only when the infection has become widespread is it that consciousness, which unheedingly yielded to its influence, becomes aware of it. When consciousness does become aware of pure insight of the enlightenment, the latter is already widespread. The struggle against it betrays the fact that infection has occurred. The struggle is too late, and every remedy adopted only aggravates the disease, for it has laid hold of the marrow of spiritual life, viz. the notion of consciousness or the pure essence itself of consciousness. Therefore, too, there is no power in consciousness which could overcome the disease because this is present in the essence itself. Its manifestations, while still isolated, can be suppressed and the superficial symptoms smothered. This is greatly to its advantage, for it does not know, it does not now squander its power or show itself unworthy of its real nature, which is the case when it breaks out in symptoms and single erup eruptions antagonistic to the content of faith and to its connection with the reality of the world outside it. Rather, being now an invisible and imperceptible spirit, it infiltrates the noble parts through and through and soon has taken complete possession of all the vitals and members of the unconscious idol. Then, one fine morning, it gives its comrade a shove with the elbow and bang, crash, the idol lies on the floor. Diderot, Ramo's nephew, blah, 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 uh, on one fine morning, whose noon is bloodless, if the infection has penetrated to every organ of, of spiritual life, memory alone then still preserves the dead form of the spirit's previous shape as a vanished history. Vanished one knows not how. And the new serpent of wisdom raised high for adoration has this way painlessly cast merely a withered skin. 
<clears throat> the dialectical process is thus marked by a double scansion. First, we have the silent weaving of the spirit, the unconscious transformation of the entire symbolic network of the entire field of meaning. Then, when the work is already done and when in itself all is already decided, it is time for a purely formal act by means of which the previous shape of the spirit breaks up also for itself. The crucial point is that consciousness necessarily comes too late. It can take cognizance of the fact that the ground is cut from under its feet only when the infectious illness already dominates the field. The strategy of the new, of the spiritual illness, must therefore be to avoid direct confrontation for as long as possible. A patient, silent weaving, like the underground tunneling of a mole, waiting for the moment when a light push with the finger will be enough for the mighty edifice to fall to pieces. <clears throat> Does not this logic spontaneously evoke the well-known cartoon scene where a cat walks calmly over the precipice and drops only when it looks down and becomes aware of having no ground under its feet? The art of subversion is not to fight the cat while it is still walking on firm ground, but to let it continue with head held high. And in the meantime, to undermine the very ground on which it walks so that when our work is done, a simple whistle is enough, a reminder to look down beneath its feet and the cat will crumble by itself. Moreover, are we not now in the very midst of the Lacanian notion of in between two deaths? Apropos of the shape of consciousness, whose ground is already undermined by the spirit's silent weaving. Although it doesn't know it, could we not say that it is already dead without knowing it? That it is still alive only because it doesn't know it is dead. In the passage quoted, Hegel has in mind that by agreeing to take part in the debate, to answer the Enlightenment's arguments, the very reaction to the Enlightenment is already infected by it accepts in advance the logic of its enemy. I mean, do you mind if I stop for? By all means. By all means. Um, uh, so I uh, thought this was a, uh, a great passage. Uh, the, the first time around, I definitely did not understand it. Um, but I think the, I think the, most important part of this little section here is the top of 65. Um, the crucial point is that consciousness necessarily comes too late. You yes. take cognizance of the fact that the ground is kept from under its feet only when the infectious illness already dominates the field. Uh, the strategy of the new spiritual illness must there avoid to, therefore be able to avoid direct confrontation as long as possible patient silent weaving like the underground tunneling of a mole waiting for the moment when a light push with the finger will be enough for the mighty edifice or for the mighty ed edifice, edifice to fall to pieces um and so i think this kind of ties back into when zizek was talking about hegel's um dialectical monism being being retroactive um hmm. yeah um it's it's yeah it's been there all along and, and yeah I, I mean it's essentially like we you know we don't realize there's been a change in the spirit until it already happened and then the final step of the dialectic is simply a, re a recognition that a transformation even even occurred recognition yeah it, it yeah it's that point of recognition uh i think is a, is a great and um i'm surprised hegel didn't or i mean hegel zizek didn't put a footnote here but um the mole is the underground tunneling of a mole is uh something that i encountered uh um in in Marx because he he referred basically to the underground tunneling of the mole as 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 kind of analogous to uh revolution 
And I did, I looked it up. I did not know that this was actually Hegel's example. And then Marx essentially, you know, uses this as an example for class struggle in, in revolution. Um, so I, I think that will obviously play a part uh, later on in the in the chapter where he's kind of getting more concretely into how all of this figures into historical change. Yeah, the uh, it's like class consciousness has to be like a like an underground mole tunneling away, and it it a revolution necessitates the mole to have done its job before we can come to that point of recognition and enact the revolution. Yeah. Um, I can, uh, I'll uh, take over reading for a bit. Um, Sir Robert Filmer's polemics against John Locke are an exemplary case. Filmer strives to reassert patriarchal authority by means of rational argument proper to the Enlightenment. He refers to natural rights, going to great lengths to prove that in the beginning kings are biological fathers to their subjects and so on. We encounter a similar paradox with modern neoconservatives who argue for the need to eliminate egalitarian democratic excesses using arguments which borrow from the reasoning of their adversary. They point out the beneficent effects of law and order on the individual's freedom and welfare and so on. In general, we could say that an, that an ideological battle is won when the adversary himself begins to speak our language without being aware of it. What we have here is the lapse of time already mentioned. The break never occurs now in the simple present when things are brought to a decision. In itself, the battle is over before it breaks out. The very fact that it breaks out is an unequivocal sign that it is really already over. The silent weaving has already done its job, that the die is already cast. The concluding act of victory thus always has a retroactive character. The final decision has the form of asserting that all is already decided. It is not without significance that today the quoted passage from Hegel inevitably evokes psychoanalytic connotations. The silent weaving of the spirit is Hegel's term for the unconscious working through, and we would be quite justified in reading the quoted passage as a refined psychological description of the process of conversion. Let us take the case of an atheist becoming a believer. He is torn by fierce inner struggles. Religion obsesses him. He jibes aggressively at believers, looks for, for historical reasons for the emergence of the religious illusion, and so on. All this is nothing but proof that the affair is already decided. He already believes, although he doesn't yet know it. The inner struggle ends not with the big decision to believe, but with a sense of relief that, without knowing it, he has always already believed. So that all that remains for him is, for him is to renounce his vain resistance and become reconciled to his belief. The refined sense of the psychoanalyst is best attested by his ability to recognize the moment when the silent weaving has already done its work, although the patient is still beset by doubts and uncertainty. That, uh, Dostoevsky is great at, at demonstrating the person who's already made the decision but is pretending that they haven't made the decision already. Uh, or like, like if you're in a relationship and you're going to go cheat on your partner, you've already made the decision to cheat, but you are pretending that you haven't made that decision when you're, when you're like, Oh, maybe I will, maybe I won't like, no, you've already made up your mind. Like that decision is already there. And then coming to that point of recognition, you may not ever come to that point of recognition because you like you've already made your mind up. It's already going to happen. I mean, perhaps like an, on the level of the unconscious. Yeah, yeah. Like the the unconscious decision has already been made, and now it's up to you, the the ego, to come to terms with the fact that 
that decision has already been made. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a, I mean, you could even use that for, you know, when, uh, you know, at least one person in relation in, in the relationship has kind of already recognized that it's probably not going to go anywhere, but you know, it could potentially take years for the person to come to terms with that. Yeah. Know? And it's, it's, it's not, it's not at that point, it's not a conscious decision. It's, it's uh it's a recognition. The decision was made years ago. Yes. And then when they have that recognition, it's, it's like, they retroactively make that decision. Ah, damn it. I'm struggling to say what I'm trying to say, but. You know, it almost reminds me of, of um, the emperor, the, the emperor with no clothes example where, you know, I, you know, Mikey talks about how, you know, everyone knows the emperor has no clothes, but there's one person who doesn't know. And that's the big other, the symbolic. And so, I think it's similar, you know, you could say in a relationship, both people know that the relationship is effectively over. It's just the symbolic doesn't know the, the big other doesn't know the third, the third, the third person in, in the, the, this triad doesn't know. So rather than staying together for the kids, they're staying together for the big other to to satisfy the big (laughs) other. I I like that. Yeah. It's very Um, apt. I think the the other example I was I was thinking of that is is just more straightforwardly political, um, and uh, is uh, the the October Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, the actual taking power of the Bolsheviks in 1917 was a relatively bloodless affair that was met with pretty little with little resistance i mean at least initially and then civil war broke out and that's that's another story um but i i when you read about the the months and days leading up to the official date the bolsheviks took power uh you get the sense that the supporters were simply waiting for Lenin to sign on the dotted line and announce to the symbolic that the workers had taken power. And so therefore, when it actually happened, it was somewhat of an anticlimactic event because everyone, you know, again, uh, you know, we can return to Zizek's reference to the emperor with no clothes. Um, You know, I think I think Zizek kind of reads Hegel's silent weaving of the spirit as meaning the 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 symbolic is always the last to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, it's great that this logic can be applied to something as macro as a you know social revolution, all the way down to some you know. Uh, to you know our infidelity our interpersonal relationships um but yeah i think you know and we we can see here you know as Mikey said zizek is is weaving hegel and lacan together and it it's just uh into like a a beautiful tapestry yeah you know and that yeah the fact that he he is He's doing Hegel by way of Lacan. Uh, yeah, I, I, to me, that's that's how I think about it anyway. Because, I mean, Hegel. I guess needs needs Lacan in a way for for some of this stuff to really kind of click into focus because it it can remain a little bit abstract. Yeah. W- without that. Um, Hey, you know, this is, we're not just talking about social forces and, and materialism and moan. Like we're not just talking about that. We're also talking about the human experience. Exactly. Exactly. Um, um, so yeah. Um, do you have anything else to add about the, that, that passage? Um, yeah. 
no i i think it i i think it it's great yeah um, yeah i think one of my my favorite in this this whole chapter um but uh yeah let's let's uh let's continue okay so from nothingness through nothingness to nothingness a first response to a reproach of Hegel's monism would thus be to assert that Hegel is an even more radical monist than his critics dare to imagine. In the course of the dialectical process, difference is not overcome, its very existence is retroactively canceled. Do we not, however, thus find ourselves occupying the untenable position of defenders of an absurdly strong monism? All that effectively exists is the one. Differences are only fictitious with no foundation in reality. The way out of this apparent impasse is shown by the very circular nature of the dialectical process. Through it, things become what they always already were. The worn out commonplace is usually conceived as pointing towards Hegel's supposed ontological evolutionism. Development in its entirety is just an explication of what the thing already is in itself, implicitly an external realization of its inner potential. The circle of the dialectical development is thus closed. Nothing really new happens. The seed is in itself already the tree and so on. To dispel the specter of this ontological evolutionism as a rule imputed to Hegel, one has to reverse the whole perspective by introducing the dimension of radical negativity. The truth of any determined particular thing lies in its self-annihilation. The proposition, a thing becomes what it has always already been, therefore reads, in the course of the dialectical, dialectical process, a thing reaches its truth by means of sublating its immediate being. A step towards truth implies, by definition, a loss of being. Um, and I think that's might be there. There's a lot there too, so maybe it might be a good place to stop. Um, that almost no, it doesn't. I was going to say that almost kind of points to extimacy, but I don't think it does. I think it. I think it points more to. the fact that our identity is a result of our internal contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's extimacy. I, I think extimacy is a little different than that. Yeah. I mean, uh, my, my understanding of extimacy is something that um, we could think of, you know, uh, our, our unconscious as something being extimate. In other words, our unconscious is, is out there it's in when we speak to other subjects and there's a slip of the tongue it's not somewhere buried deep within us it's it's out there it's in the symbolic yeah partly, at least yeah so this yeah we we create identity our, our identities almost as a consequence of our internal contradictions um I mean, I, I think I think Zizek is is trying to ev emphasize here that the you the uniqueness of Hegel's monism is that it relies on negation, on self annihilation. Which, at first glance, you think, well, that seems con uh, counterintuitive because we think of monism as 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 um, being at odds with negation, but I, I think this 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 part brought to mind uh, Hegel's statement that that substance is is subject, and so the the things in Hegel's monism have gaps, have splits, have voids. The ones, the one in the ones of Hegel's monism you know, you have these gaps, these splits, these voids, and these 
uh, nothings are what give substantiality to to things. So Swiss cheese incorporates the voids, and that's what makes it Swiss cheese. Exactly. <laughs> In a very <laughs> dumbed down layman's term, because um, I mean, there is Swiss cheese that doesn't have the void, but the the platonic Swiss cheese. Yes. Those voids are constitutive. They're exactly. not. They're not just inconsequential side effects. Like they are part and parcel of the substance, yes. which also which is the subject as well. There you go. That's that's. I'm never gonna. <laughs> I'm never gonna be able to look at a piece of Swiss cheese the same way again after that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it becomes what it has always already. I, I, I like becomes what it has always already been. I like that a lot. Um, and I mean, that keeps surfacing over and over again. Um, yeah. but I, I mean, I like that. That's dialectics. Yeah. I mean, he, you, you can, um, I mean, I, I Mikey, Mikey said that this chapter basically is in, in some ways uh, a repeat of, of the first chapter and he's hitting all those same um, the, all these same themes and um, you know each time it's it's in a slightly different way uh, at a slightly different angle we're looking at the same the same theme I feel like. And we need to incorporate that difference. Yes. Or recognize <laughs> that the difference was always already there. Oh, um, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we on we are proposition. Second second paragraph of sixty seven. Sixty seven. All right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let us recall that the Lacanian distinction between the two deaths. <clears throat> Let us recall the Lacanian distinction between the two deaths and connect it with the Hegelian theory of repetition in history. Everybody has to die twice. Napoleon at Elba was already dead. His historical role was over, but he still agitated and tried to recapture power. Why? There is only one possible answer. He wasn't aware that he was dead. In this precise sense, we could say that... With the defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon became what he already was, dead. He died for the second time. Far from being an exception, a delay disturbing the normal course of the dialectics of the historical process. Napoleon at Elba is the paradigm of its elementary matrix. The entire span of the dialectical process takes place between the two deaths. An entity becomes what it is by realizing its inherent negativity. In other words, by taking cognizance of its own death. What is absolute knowledge but a name for the final moment of this process when consciousness purifies itself of every presupposition of a positive being, the moment paid for by a radical loss, the moment which coincides with pure nothingness. So uh, again, I just gotta I gotta stop here, again because this is great, great stuff. So um, I was not uh, initially familiar with the Lacanian two deaths um, concept, but I I, I did um, look it up, and it, it definitely was worth doing so. Um, and so. I came across two different interpretations of, of what Lacan meant by the two deaths. The first one is that um, the human subject goes through, can, can die symbolically. And then of course they can die in terms of the real, their actual biological bodies can die. And so I was a little confused as to how this applied to Napoleon, because of course it seems like he goes, he's essentially going through two different symbolic 
deaths. Um, and it's not necessarily referencing his, his death in, in, in the real. Um, so I was a little, I, I mean, perhaps I was a little, uh, uh, confused by, by the example, uh, again, but perhaps I'm, uh, missing, missing something. Yeah. So I mean is it just Napoleon be became irrelevant in his defeat and then in his exile I mean, you could even read it as being first this tragedy, then as farce. Mm. You know? Okay. Um, but again, like, I can understand it on that level, but then, you know, Zizek is bringing in the Lacanian distinction between two deaths, and that's where um, I, I, I get a little thrown off by the example he uses. Um, but I... I I did come across a second interpretation, which I think is a little more interesting. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy named Peter Rollins. Peter um, Rollins. He is, I don't even know how to describe him. He, he's someone who kind of uh, integrates uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, Hegelianism, and then uh, radical Christian theology. Um, and his interpretation of Lacan's distinction between two deaths was essentially that we can refer to our first death as being castration. Oh, okay. Um, in which we're, you know, forced to take on language and the law, you know, our desire now having to be mediated through both. And so that's our first death. Uh, and he makes the analogy that that's essentially what baptism is you know baptism you're essentially drowning you know that's your your first death and then our second death is of course our actual death you know our um and so you know in this way we can say you know that uh, that uh you know the symbolic death it contains you know two deaths, you know, one on the way in and, and, and one on the way out. Um, yeah. And so I, that, that I do like that, that kind of jived a little bit better with this example. I, I feel like, but um, I guess I, I, I you know, um, I guess, yeah, again, I, you know, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, become what it is by re realizing its its inherent negativity. In other words, by taking cognizance of its own death. So, yeah, you. I mean, one if you become cognizant of your castration, or if if you take that to mean a symbolic death, then then you can come to terms with it and and craft an identity for yourself rather than settle for the one that's been handed to you by society. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I do like that. And that's very fitting as the castration being the, the first death and then the actual death being. When you actually croak your biological body. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I guess, an I mean, another, another thing you can bring in is again, we're talking about between, we're talking about between two deaths. So we're talking about a gap. We're talking about a void. We're talking about a split. That's where, that's where the the that's where definitions of things uh, of things are are located they're in in the in the in between um yeah it's uh it, that's where you put the the filling on the sandwich yeah. in between yep that that's where the juicy bits are exactly yeah there you go um and so, um, yeah, um, those, those, that, that was, th those were the thoughts I had about that, uh, that 
just one paragraph. So, yeah, I yeah, I like that, and that does taking that castration as the first death. I think really does help. I mean, maybe we could even think about it in terms of like the the what is it? Um, Napoleon's first defeat as being representative of, you know, every subject goes through castration. And then the second death is, is the recognition of, of that castration, which ideally, if someone goes through psychoanalysis, they're able to take on or recognize that they, they are, they are castrated, that their desire is mediated. Um, you know, so perhaps there's, there's that connection in terms of, uh, the psychoanalytic process as well. Cause I, I, I know Zizek always talks about subjective destitution, which seems to me to effectively mean a second castration in which you recognize you are castrated yeah and maybe if not if not a second castration but definitely the almost embracing that yeah that initial castration and 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 taking it on rather rather than passively um dealing with it but not ever recognizing it or acknowledge it but but actually co coming to terms with it and it's already done the work, but allowing it to retroactively do the work and then moving yeah. forward. Yeah. Uh, uh, radical loss of the moment, which coincides with pure nothingness. All right. This nothingness reached at the very end of the phenomenology of spirit is just another name for the fact that notion doesn't exist or to use Lacan's terms that the big other doesn't exist, that it is a dead, purely formal structure without any substantial content. Herein lies the answer to the reproach of absolute monism. Hegel appears a monist only if we impute actual substantial being to notion. That is to say, only if we forget the above described negative relationship between knowledge and being. The ill-famed Hegelian formula ascertaining the identity of reason and actuality should therefore be read in a way that differs from the usual. It means that neither reason, reason nor actuality exist in itself. Actuality is in itself null. Without any consistency, it exists only insofar as it is grounded to the notional structure Oh, my damn tablet rotated. Actuality is in itself null without any consistency. It exists only insofar as it is grounded in the notional structure, structured through reason. On the other hand, Hegel is anti-Plato par excellence. There is nothing more alien to him than a substantialist conception of notion, claiming that only notions effectively exist. All that effectively exists is extra notional nature and history. Notion is nothing but their pure logical structure without any sustainability. I like that a lot. It, for a long time, I've, I've, I feel like Hegel plays with Kant. Uh, and it's not like an inversion of, I think therefore I am, but it's, it's playing with, that it's not just oh. Oh. see I, I i never i i struggle to to put it into words but it's it's playing with i guess the well i guess uh it's it's allowing a little bit of idealism to to exist within our materialism Mm -hmm. in a way um it it's <sighs> yeah i don't know i've been thinking about it for forever for years <laughs> how exactly to say 
what I want to say. Yeah, I guess the, the part that I really, um, the sentence I really was trying to um, play with and, and parse out what it meant was um, that second bullet point, the last sentence, all that effectively exists is extra notional nature and history notion is nothing but their pure logical structure without any substantiality and i think that kind of gets to what you were talking about with hegel allowing for a little bit of idealism within materialism um because i guess the way i interpreted that is Notion seems to be, perhaps we could, we could say notion is, is the recognition of the contradictory form, capital, you know, capital F form of nature and history enabled by reason. Mm. Um, rather than, you know, notion being the recognition, not, you know, not only is nature and history contradictory in terms of, of, of content, but in, in their notion is, is, is the contradictory nature of the form of nature and history itself de devoid of any, of any of, of the content. Okay. Yeah. Um, which I, I think kind of helps me ground a little bit more what Hegel means um, by, by notion. <sighs> yeah. I just feel like any substantiality. Yeah, maybe it'll maybe it'll come back to me. It almost came into focus for a second. <laughs> I can I can uh, take over. Um, All right. I'm actually gonna sit step out for one minute. I got my headphones. Oh, all good. Um, in a sense, we could say that absolute knowledge implies the recognition of an absolute insurmountable impossibility. The impossibility of accordance between knowledge and being. Here one should reverse Kant's formula of the transcendental conditions of possibility. Every positively given object is possible. It emerges only against the background of its impossibility. It can never fully become itself, realize all its potential, achieve full identity with itself. Insofar as we accept the Hegelian definition of truth, the accordance of an object with its notion, we could say that no object is ever true, ever fully becomes what it effectively is. This discord is a positive condition of the object's ontological consistency, not because the notion would be an ideal never to be achieved by an empir empirical object, but because the notion itself partakes of the dialectical movement. As soon as an object comes too close to its notion, this proximity changes, displaces the notion itself. Take the three shapes of the absolute spirit, art, religion, and philosophy, a form of art in total accordance with the notion of art, in which the idea appears unmutilated in the medium of the senses, would no longer be art, but already religion. With religion, however, the very measure of truth, the notion to which the object must correspond, changes. In a homologous way, philosophy is nothing but a form of religion with, which corresponds to its notion. I, 
I like a lot the comparison of art and religion. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not the comparison, but the the almost like um you know, religion in a way could be seen as as just art that takes itself seriously to a degree, maybe. Um, and again, there's, it's, it's thick. There's a lot there that, that wants to, wants to be said. I just can't. I guess find the words. I th I think I think I I the way I interpreted the um Zizek's um explication of of um art and the notion of art in Hegel um I think I I understood it. I'll, I'll read the, the quote. A form of art in total accordance with the notion of art in which the idea appears unmutilated in the medium of the senses would no longer be art, but already religion. And so the way I interpreted that was if you had a particular piece of art that somehow was able to that that exactly aligned with let's say the uh i don't know the the platonic ideal or form then that would be a piece of art that was so sublime it would roll over into being uh into into the religious And yeah. no longer be art and so we, we could think of the 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 particular piece the particular piece of art as being the object and the the ideal as being the notion yeah and so you the the within hegel's dialectic the uh, you can almost think about it as like a i don't know a, a prisoner on a, a ball and chain like as soon as as the prisoner moves that ball and chain is coming with him it doesn't stay there and so if and so what what essentially happens is is the 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 object can or vice versa the notion pulls they they, they are pull each other in in whatever direction they're 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 going yeah it's, it's a it's a push me pull you type situation yeah and i th i think yeah i think uh maybe not Maybe not necessarily, but I think, um, I think they they do exist in tandem. Um, and maybe it's it's uh, it's modal. It's it's an experience that it's on the same plane. And if you move too far in one direction or the other, uh, then you kind of come in. Oh well, that's art, and well, no, that's religion. But it is is the same thing, and it's the ideal that maybe defines that uh spectrum that that it sits on yeah and i guess uh, i don't know if this example I, again i i think what jizek is trying to say that the 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 gulf between the object and and its notion is is what gives shape to the object itself so again it's the, it's a nothing that is that creates the, a something a substantiality the universal, the universal particular um yeah this is my phone Th this the identity of this is my phone because here it is um and it's it's not the platonic ideal of a phone is what makes it my phone it, like it's um it's what separates tree. it 
Yeah, it, exactly. The separation is what is what gives it its meaningful identity. Yes. Uh, the tree outside my house, it doesn't have treeness. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's a tree. That's it's universal. But then the particular that makes it that tree that I'm talking about is that uh, that gap. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I almost want to um, like the the as soon as an object comes too close to its notion, this proximity changes and displaces the notion itself. I almost want to think of like uh, when you move one magnet with another, like hmm. you, can't, you you like you can't you can't get the. I mean, I guess you can but, with enough force, but you can't like they. There's always going to be that that gap when you're you're you know pushing one magnet against another. And that, that is what defines its yeah. meaningful identity or its particular identity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that that's, uh, that's the end of that section. I, I guess I, uh, did want to try to maybe parse out in uh, the last sentence in a homologous way, philosophy is nothing but a form of religion, which corresponds to its notion. Um, I, I guess I just want to bookmark that bookmark that as something I'd like to, to figure out what I was able to figure out the relation between art and religion, but um, I'm, I'm a little iffy on, on, on um, the relationship between philosophy and and uh, religion, yeah, which which corresponds to its notion. Um, I mean, because you could say philosophy. is a form of religion, you know, with commitments to materiality. But that, that is not the same as, as saying philosophy is nothing but a form of religion, which corresponds to its notion. I, yeah. I think that's. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I, I can understand like, you know, a, a piece, I mean, and often people describe, you know, in encounters with, you know, certain pieces of pieces of art as being analogous to a religious experience, you know, so I can understand a piece of art that's so sublime that it actually is experienced as not being art, as being the religious. And so a form of religion that is so what, uh, so... Um, I, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know what that blank is that is so X that it becomes philosophy. I, I'm not sure what that X is. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, of course, philosophy can touch on the sublime and the numinous um, I, I mean, with like sophistry and stuff like that, like it, it, it is ex expressly like a, a religious experience, but, uh, maybe not religious experience, but yeah, a religious endeavor. What is the X is a great question. What is the X that defines okay, we'll, we'll try to mark that down for, uh, <laughs> for uh mikey to maybe answer um actually yeah i yeah i am going to make a note to try to ask that in the lecture yeah um i mean because i i cannot like uh, if you look at the history of philosophy it for a, a long period of of the history of there is no separation or gap between philosophy and, and the religious. When we think about, you know, the European middle ages, 
philosophy and religion were philosophy and theology were the same thing essentially um but obviously um right right here we're speaking on the level of 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 ideas not necessarily um just base materiality and so yeah um let's let's see if we can figure out what that 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 x is because not yeah not quite sure what it is yeah all right the condition of m possibility the picture of the hegelian system as a closed hole which assigns its proper place to every partial moment is therefore deeply misleading every partial moment is so to speak truncated from within it cannot ever fully become itself it cannot ever reach its own place. It is marked with an inherent impediment, and it is this impediment which sets in motion the dialectical development. The one of Hegel's monism is thus not the one of an identity encompassing all differences, but rather a paradoxical one of radical negativity which forever blocks the fulfillment of any positive identity. The Hegelian cunning of reason is to be conceived precisely against the background of this impossible accordance of the object with its notion. We do not destroy an object by ma uh, mangling it from outside, but quite on the contrary, by allowing it to freely evolve its potential and thus arrive at its truth. Cunning list is something other than trickery. F -f 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 the most open public activity is the greatest cunning the other must be taken in its truth in other words with his openness a man exposes the other in himself he appears as he is and for himself and thereby does away with himself cunning is the great art of inducing others to be as they are as they are in and for themselves and to bring this out to the light of consciousness Although others are in the right, they do not know how to defend it by means of speech. Muteness is bad, mean cunning. Consequently, a true master is at bottom only he who can provoke the other to transform himself through his act. The cunning of reason simply takes into account the split that is ontologically constitutive of the other. The fact that the other never fully corresponds to its notion it does not, therefore, have to be obstructed. It suffices to entice it to reveal its truth. Confident that the other will thereby dissolve, transform itself. Such a procedure has a place in the most intimate interpersonal relationships, as well as in political strategy. When, for example, in a strained interpersonal relationship, somebody complains of the way their partner frustrates them in the realization of their potential. It is wise to withdraw and leave the way open for the supposed victim of oppression. It will soon become clear whether there was any substantial content behind the meaning or whether the other's entire identity consists in such meaning and groaning. That is, did the other desperately need the figure of a repressive adversary in the absence of which their whole identity would disintegrate? <sighs> Did the other desperately need the figure of a repressive adversary in the absence of which their whole identity would disintegrate? I think that is very pertinent to politics. Yeah. To, to contemporary politics. Um, especially we have a lot of people who want to define themselves as activists, but they take up positions in opposition to certain phenomena or certain certain things. Um, and that's not a positive identity. That's not um, like as an anti-fascist, mm -hmm. you depend on fascism um, rather than existing as someone who is, a, is happens to be opposed to fascism along with many other things. Yeah. If, if that identity is, I am an anti-fascist. Well, God forbid we ever get get rid of fascism because <laughs> then you fade off into nothingness. No, I I I I think we're 
um, getting into the territory of the scapegoat, you know, yes, um, yeah, where the, uh, you know, we can think of the Nazis and, and, and anti-Semitism, you know, where their existence is inextricably linked to um, the, exi- the continued existence of, of, of the Jewish people in Europe and in, in Nazi Germany. Um, you know, I think that, um, the, the, um, Hegelian, uh, or, um, the, uh, passage that, uh, Zizek quoted from Hegel, um, the Hegelian cunning of reason is to be conceived precisely against the background of the impossible accordance of the object with its notion. We do not destroy an object by mangle, mangling it from the outside, but quite on the contrary, by allowing it to freely evolve its potential and arrive at its truth. Um, the bit about to, allowing it to freely evolve in its potential and arrive at its truth, that made me think of of you know um free association in psychoanalysis where the mm. lacanian analyst kind of just hangs back and allows the subject to speak and eventually the unconscious will come out in some way and you don't do that by you know intentionally trying to coax it out eventually it'll the the split in the subject will reveal itself right um That, I think, is how, and this is tangent, but uh, I think that's how a lot of people view like a teleological Marxism. They, They get like a vulgar accelerationism and they think, oh, we'll just stand back and let the march of history progress until we reach the inevitable, uh, workers revolution and and maybe that might be an appropriate way to destroy society but we don't want to destroy society we want to <laughs> we want to save society sure yeah yeah i mean i um yeah i guess that that is interesting to think about how does this because in a certain way you could read this and be like Okay, well, the cunning of reason is essentially is essentially you know Mar- maybe a certain understanding of Marx saying, well, capitalism will just fall apart on its own of its own internal contradictions. We don't the workers don't have to do anything. We don't need to do anything subjectively to aim at to for the revolution for capitalism to to fall apart and i think the the importance there is yes capitalism on its own will fall apart will mangle itself that won't necessarily result in socialist revolution um and so i think that's where the the crucial distinction um it comes in it's it's like uh we could have the end of the world, but yeah, capitalism will will mingle itself, will destroy the earth. And I, I think, uh, yeah, of course, of course, capitalism will will destroy itself and 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 uh, do untold harms, because at the core of capitalism, that is its identity, that is its yeah. function, is to reduce and and create waste you know, almost like a, like a battalion read of, of that is the identity of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not a desired outcome. Like we want, we want, we want to forge a new social identity. Yeah. um... I, I, I can, uh, unless you had anything else to say, I can, uh, take up from, from, from here. Um, good. Uh, Daniel Saboni, 
recognized the same procedure in what he called Mitterrand's work as an analyst. Instead of pushing the communists into a political ghetto, Mitterrand wisely asked them to join the government, putting to test their capability to govern. The result is known. It became evident that there is no substantial political content behind their reformist rhetoric. It should be clear now in what sense Lacan in the early 50s, under the obvious influence of Kojev, equated the position of the psychoanalyst to that of the Hegelian sage. The psychoanalyst's inactivity consists in not intervening actively in the work of the analyzan and refusing to offer him or her any support in the shape of ideals, goals, and so on. The analyst just lets, enables him or her to arrive at his or her repressed content and to articulate it in the medium of speech whereby this content is tested as to its truth. Um, so again, I just, I just had the uh, example pop into my head of, you know, um, um, I had, I had two different like uh, examples pop into my head. One being something similar to where, I don't know, like, a, you know, you have, you're at a bar and someone, you know, is being extremely aggro and then, you know, they seem like they want to fight. And then you're like, okay, let's fight. Let's go outside and fight. And then you see like, oh, well, they actually don't want to fight. You know, they just want to, you know, rile themselves up. Um, Masks. Yeah. You just let them, you know, let them go to that edge. And then they realize, oh, I, you know, I don't actually want to step over that line. Um, and then in the, another example I had was, um, you know, like, uh, watch like a, a, a crime procedural or something, you know, you'll see that they'll bring in the suspect and, you know, rather than trying to get them, you'll see like, you know, at first one of the guys tries to, you know, tell me you did it, you know. Um, and tries to like directly get them to admit, you know, guilt that doesn't work. But then you have the other guy come in and, you know, basically what he does is just have, has a conversation, maybe doesn't even directly reference what they're trying to get the guy to admit. And eventually the sub subject will lower his guard and say something that it admits their, their guilt. So, that to me is what the cunning of a reason is. It's just kind of laying in the cut and letting the person screw up. Eventually they'll screw up. Um, um, yeah. I th eventually I think, they'll reveal the split, the contradiction. I think with the interrogation example, um, ultimately we want, or maybe maybe not we want, but our unconscious wants, wants out and it, and it wants to express itself. So it's not even so much like that guy's an idiot. Just let him, let him cook and he'll self-incriminate. Yes, exactly. It's, it's that necessarily that will present itself because it, it wants to present itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, those are the things that, that came to my mind. I don't know if, yeah. Um, in terms of the, the cunning of reason and the psychoanalysts inactivity, which seemed to be kind of analogous. Yeah. Let them, let them cook. I, let I, them yeah. cook. <laughs> that's, you know, rather than, because now with, um, like with ego psych psychology and, and with like uh, other interventions, you have counselors and therapists and providers who want to control and, and direct and subject their client or their patient to these methods, whereas actual psychoanalysis is a facilitation of the client uh coming into their self yeah and i think i think that's i think that is the 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 huge difference rather than forcing s something that isn't there onto somebody yeah it's like when analysis is allowing 
that person to blossom. Yeah, I think it's 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 wanting to take a shortcut to absolutely yeah the the subject recognizing it, their their split their their lack and both Hegel and 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 psychoanalysis seems to say there there are no shortcuts, um, but again, let 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 the let the analyst. Let let the analysand cook. Let the um, you know the uh, politician cook, and eventually the contradiction will be revealed and recognized. That's that's kind of what I I took away. Yeah. Um. Oh, we're at the second paragraph of page seven. Okay. Yep. One of the great motifs of the Derridian deconstruction is the already mentioned reversal or complement of the Kantian transcendental formula of the conditions of possibility. The infrastructural condition of possibility of an entity is at the same time the condition of its impossibility its identity within itself is possible only against the background of its self relationship of a minimal self differentiation and self deferment, which opens a gap forever hindering its full identity with itself. It should also be cleared now how the same paradox is inscribed in the very heart of Hegelian dialectics. The key reversal of the dialectical process takes place when we recognize in what it first appeared as a condition of impossibility, as a hindrance to our full identity, to the realization of our potential, the condition of the possibility of our ontological consistency. Herein lies, strictly speaking, the lesson of the dialectics of beautiful soul from the phenomenology of spirit. The beautiful soul incessantly laments the cruel conditions of the world whose victim it is, which prevent the realization of its good intentions. What it overlooks is the way its own complaints contribute to the preservation of these unfortunate conditions. That is, the way the beautiful soul is itself an accomplice in the disorder of the world it bemoans. Mm. We encounter elements of the beautiful soul in a certain type of dissidence and decaying real socialism. Even after the system has begun its terminal disintegration, such dissidence still vehemently maintains that nothing has really changed, that behind a new mask, there is still the same old Bolshevik totalitarian kernel and so on. Such dissidence literally needs a Bolshevik, a totalitarian adversary, its compulsive unmasking actually provokes the adversary into displaying its totalitarian character. It lives entirely for the moment, in expectation of the moment when the mask will fall off and it will become evident that the adversary is the same old totalitarian party. The real object of desire of such a dissident is not to defeat the adversary, even less to reestablish a democratic order in which the adversary would be forced to accept the role of a rival for power on an equal footing with others, but one's own defeat in accordance with the, is that tragic? The logic. Okay, the logic. Uh, in accordance with the logic, I have to lose. I must receive a hard blow since this is the only way to demonstrate that I was right in my accusations against the enemy. So that kind of goes back to the uh, if you like if you define yourself as in opposition to a thing, then you uh, you become the thing in a way. You become reliant on the thing. You you begin to embody the very thing that you are in opposition to. Yeah, I mean it's 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 the law of identity and identity indifference so if you lose that difference then your substantial identity falls away it requires it um 
And so, you know, I, I think... You know, I think this is going to um, I think actually if we if we read the n next paragraph, like we'll be able to get to a point where I think we can fully kind of um, sit with it put, for a minute, sit with it. Um, so I'll, I'll just read that this next paragraph and then we'll we'll take a, a pause. Um, this paradoxical reasoning reasoning clearly illustrates the inherently antagonistic character of desire. My official desire is for the Communist Party to change into a democratic partner and rival. But in fact, I fear such a change more than the plague itself. Since I know very well that it would take that it would make me lose my footing and force me radically to modify my whole strategy. My real desire is thus for the party not to change, to remain totalitarian. The enemy figure, the party, supposed to impede my fulfillment is in truth the very precondition of my position of beautiful soul, without which I would lose the big culprit, the point by reference to which my subjective position acquires its consistency. It is against this background that we must conceive Hegel's proposition from his science of logic. By way of reconciliation, the negative force recognizes in what it fights and what it fights against its own essence. In the monster of the party, the negative force of dissidence must recognize an entity on which hangs its own ontological consistency, an entity that can, confers meaning upon its activity, in other words, its essence. And so I think the, the two key quote, the two key quotes I, I took out of that were one, the very top of page 71, the real object of desire of such, of such a dissident is not to defeat the adversary, even less to reestablish a democratic order in which the adversary would be forced to accept the role of a rival for power on an equal footing with others, but one's own defeat. And then my real desire is this for the party not to change, to remain totalitarian, the enemy figure, the party supposed to impede my fulfillment is in truth the very precondition of my position of beautiful soul. Without it, I would lose the big culprit, the point of reference to which my subjective position acquires its consistency. So the, the way I interpreted that was that the the beautiful soul that is that is the Eastern Bloc dissident is not able to realize that on the level of the unconscious it enjoys not having. And then so what essentially happens is that the goalposts of what victory over totalitarianism means are constantly moved because that allows desire to be maintained because that prolongs not having, which is what the dissident really enjoys. And so, you know, as soon as, as, as their object, which is the defeat of, of totalitarianism gets too close, they change the notion of what, of, of what their ideal of a free democratic society is in order to maintain enjoyment. One, I wonder how much, uh, maybe not how much, but I, I, remember the fact that Zizek was, inundated in this like Zizek watched this happen yes um and and that to me it makes me want to relate this to what i what i see because i can um look at you know most of my neighbors have the you know god guns freedom like like i'm in a 
pretty conservative area. Um, and it makes me want to not because in my head, I, I can say, oh, you know, they people just do that to cover up for, for you know, the lack and, and they're not bad people. They're just doing this stuff because we're, we're all dissatisfied. We're all, you know, none of our needs are met, let alone our desires. And so we all just kind of adopt these affectations to mm -hmm. to kind of cope with it or whatever. But it, it makes me really want to like sit down and in in detail really um maybe not analyze, but like go in depth um with with my specific material conditions. Because it's I mean, I think, I think it's important for on the left for us to, to kind of push back on, on a lot of the like internet politics bullshit that goes on and a lot of the like rad lib bullshit that gets confused for left. Mm -hmm, um, for sure. I, I think we, we need to do that, but I really do think, um, along with that, maybe criticizing the left or some whatever uh, along with that, I think we really need to <sighs> intimately get in touch with the uh, ostensibly reactionary uh, what, what the Radlibs would describe as the enemy. I, th I think we, we need to, kind of, I guess, maybe develop a politic based on disenfranchised uh, American people who think they're part of the middle class, but aren't middle class, but they've been sold that ideology. Uh, and, and that's what keeps their motor running. Yeah, I think, I think um, right here, I know, um, Mikey talks about how maybe the, um, you know, the full title of the book, you know, enjoyment um, as a political factor is not, it's not immediately clear where in the book Zizek is actually talking about enjoyment. Right here, this is enjoyment as a political factor, not having the beautiful soul. That is, Zizek is explicating that right here. Um and, you know, I think the, 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 enjoy, the enjoyment of not having is something that is, is present on, on the right and the left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the beautiful soul syndrome is present on the right and, and the left. You know, we could see, you know, um, resist, you know, the whole idea of re resistance, the, you know, the resistance liberals where, you know, there is a fetishization of not having, of not being in power, of always right. being, of always resisting. Um, Despite the fact it, that they are, the, they are the hegemons. They are. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I think among liberals, that's, um present but I, I think among the left that is also very much present i have considered myself as being on the left since i was roughly 16 years old and there is definitely something romantic and appealing in the idea of you know res of being in the resistance position of being in the master slave dialectic being on the side of of the slave you know being on the side of opposition you know <laughs> Actually being in power, uh, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's not as, there's not as much excitement in that, you know, it's. Um, yeah. And I think, I, th I mean, definitely we, we, you know, it's the fairy tale of the Viva la Revolution, you know, we do graffiti and, and it, it like we are, uh, yeah, we're outsiders and, and, and we're we, outsiders. We enjoy, yeah, yeah, we enjoy being um, 
other than, um, and I think maybe people, people really do need to accept the fact that the left aesthetic left is, is the mainstream now. And so if, if you want to continue to be a leftist, this is the shit you need to get into. This is, this is the new outsider shit, this shit that we're yeah. doing now. Um, because, you know, piercings and tattoos and, and mohawks and, and that's yeah. mainstream now. Yeah. That's, that's not enough. You can't, no. you can't be an outsider when you do that. In fact, now on the right, they're getting that same enjoyment from being the outsider because yeah. they, they feel that they are being uh, shoved out of the limelight. They're, they're and, the countercultural force. Exactly. And, yeah. and that's why being counterculture is, is not, it's not a position. It's, it's not, not it. It's not, yeah. it's not. Yeah. I mean, I, Zizek is constantly talking about, you know, the day after the revolution, what happens the day after no one wants to think about the day after everyone wants to think about the before and the during, but the after that's not sexy. That's not, that's not enjoyment. That's, you know, and and it's, I don't know what quite the, the solution is. I mean, um, I think automation, automation is, it maybe presents new opportunities to rethink a lot of stuff. Um, because that, now, were we in power, that would give us the ability to do away with the shitty jobs that people don't want to do and, 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 the, and the bullshit. Um, but we're not in power right now. But, but I think we do need to take automation and robots and, and shit into consideration when we're thinking about the day after the revolution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess to try to loop it back around to the the text again, because I, I guess technically we're supposed to be doing exegesis, but you know, I I love kind of going off in tangents, so it's very difficult. Um, the, I think what what is happening in this in this section again is Zizek is saying that for Lacan in in Hegel, the 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 subject the object the notion what have you maintains its consistency or enjoyment through there being some distance between the subject and the object of desire there needs to be that gap there needs to be that void there can't be a completely perfect overlap or else you there's you, you, you can't see anything there's no there, there's no contrast there needs to be yeah. at least the ability to to distinguish between a foreground and a background and um you know i don't think zizek doesn't say this explicitly but i think i think this void this minimum distance um which um i really like this this is not my own understanding of it. There's this uh, professor, Samuel McCormick. Um, he just lectures on Lacan and he, he refers to objet petit a as being the minimum distance between the object and the object of desire necessary to maintain desire. Mm. So I think, again, you, you, the subject and the object of desire needs that minimum distance, that objet petit a, the object and its notion needs that minimum distance. We could call that the objet petit a as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Um, so it's not replacing that uh, desire or, or that enjoyment with uh, identity, but it's applying the same logic of identity to the subject and the object of yes. desire. Yes. 
yeah i think you know um yeah i you know i'm not sure i'm not sure what hegel's um you know uh specific term is for that 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 gap but i think both cases there there's object objet petit a is 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 at play and that's what zizek is is trying to get at right get at here um and then i love here where he says um uh he he i would uh the the uh the enemy figure the party supposed to impede my f f fulfillment is in truth the very precondition of my position of beautiful soul without it i would lose the big culprit by reference to which my subjective position acquires its consistency i assume he's saying you know big culprit means big other yeah, it, 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 I think even explicitly, uh, yeah, that is your uh, your justification. Your the the big scapegoat. Yeah, I, I like the big corporate a lot because it is the again, uh, if you're if you define yourself as an anti-fascist, um. You're not trying to eradicate fascism. You're sure. trying to uh, prolong your existence as an anti-fascist, and yes. and that fascism is your big culprit, and is and that is your big other. At, yeah. Yes. And again, this happens on the level of the unconscious, and that's where enjoyment lies on the level of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. This is not necessary. I mean, maybe there are. I mean, it, you know, maybe there there are people who. Uh, you know, um, recognize this consciously for the most part, it's not, well, this is happens I in think... the level of ideology, which we maybe most of the time we don't recognize it as, as, as such, cause we're so immersed in it. We're not able to, you know, recognize that we're in it. I think there's, I think that's, that's my default position of, of yes, that's ideology. But I also think, I think we all know it and we just, sure. I, th I it's think it's not so, know it. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, yes, <laughs> that's, a, that's perfect. We, we all know it, no close. but we, we keep playing along anyway yep. to satisfy that, uh, it's all bullshit and we all know it's yeah. bullshit, but we keep doing it anyway, because to do otherwise would be unthinkable. Yeah. It would be traumatic. You know, it, like, would, it would be, yeah. The symbolic doesn't know yet though. How, that, that's, that's a great, yeah. that's a great way to say that. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, again, again, like the, like, um, I feel like this, this, as I'm rereading this text the second time, um, you just have, um, uh, I'm trying to think of, I just, I just forgot it. What I, I'm trying to remember what the term is for like the structure of a crystal or like, um, where it's, you just have like repeats of the same patterns over and over again. Um, oh man, there's a word that's, that's calling to me too from somewhere in you, the depths. Yeah. Um, um, but that imagery, yeah. The, like the, the crystalline repetition, the, yeah. The lattice. Um, um God, I wish I could remember it. Um, but do you know what I'm, I, you know what I'm referring to? It's like you, you just have repetitions of the same structures over and over again on macro and micro levels within, within this chapter. Um, yeah. And. Uh, Difference in repetition. There you go. Um, so. Um, 
yeah i think uh i guess we can yeah we, we can uh where were we this okay, paradoxical one. logic yep um, this paradoxical logic could be further exemplified via a notion which is a kind of analytic, analytical philosophy pendant to the Hegelian cunning of reason, that of the states that are essentially byproducts elaborated by John Elster. When, as a result of the subject's activity, a certain non-intended state of things emerges, when, for example, in a totalitarian state in disintegration, an attempt at intimidation backfires and strengthens the forces of democratic opposition, like the murder of Chamorro during the last months of the Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua, the subject has no right to say, I didn't intend this, and thus eludes his responsibility. Insofar as actuality is rational, it is precisely the external social realization of our aims and intentions that testifies to their true meaning. When we realize our intention, we are confronted with its truth. This is also the way to conceive the famous Lacanian proposition that the speaker receives from the other, his addressee, his own message in its inverted, mm. its true form. The subject whose activity misfires, who achieves the opposite of what he intended, must gather enough strength to acknowledge in this unlooked for result the truth of his intention. That is to say, truth is always the truth of the symbolic big other. It does not occur in the intimacy of our inner self-experience. It results from the way my activity is inscribed in the public field of intersubjective relations. To quote the famous final phrase of Lacan's seminar on the purloined letter, a letter always arrives at its destination. Although the beautiful soul is not prepared to recognize itself as the addressee of the letter returned by social reality, Although it refuses to decipher in the disorder of the world the truth of its own subjective position, the letter nevertheless reaches its destination. The order of the world is a message testifying to the truth of the subject's position. The more this message, message is ignored, the more it insists and pursues its silent weaving. Mm. So that's almost to say, um, even if we get in the way of our true intentions or our identity expressing itself, I mean, that's all we're doing is getting in the way of those truly expressing themselves. Um, but regardless, it expresses itself. Um, despite our best efforts to, to conceal it. Yeah. I mean, it almost makes me think about how, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if Freud or, or it was Lacan who said that, said this, I think it was Lacan, but he basically said, there's no such thing as lying in psychoanalysis, you know? The very fact of trying to cover up, the very fact of trying to lie, you're, you're, you, that's, is still you lying in that instance is you telling a certain truth. There's no, there's no getting out of it. And, you know, or, you know, it brings me back to the example of, you know, when you say something, you know, if you say something mean or cruel to someone and then you say, oh, no, but I, I didn't, don't interpret it that way. I didn't mean that you know it's like that's, no uh, that's <laughs> what you said and is the the inscription of it in the big other is is where the truth of that lies not what your your what your intended um meaning for the signifier yeah that you threw out there that uh that plays with the death of the author, um, mm -hmm. you know, just despite, you know, it, it doesn't matter um, if you meant to hurt that girl's feelings when he called her a bitch. It, the effect, the effect exists outside of your intentions. Exactly. 
just like the unconscious exists out there. It doesn't exist in the depths of my psyche. Right. You know, um, you know, a letter always arrived at its destination. If you, you know, called the person a bitch or what have you, there was something in you that made that, there was something in you that made that signifier come out. Doesn't matter what you believe caused that at the level of, of the ego, on the level of the imaginary. Um, there was some truth there, even if you do not know from where it came from. Um, and so I, I think that's, you know, I, again, um, you know, I, I, mean, I really like that at the end, you know, Zizek is kind of bringing in Lacan. Um, yeah, absolutely. Tie this all up. Because most of the chapter was, you know, pretty heavy on the Hegel. And again, I, th I think that's Zizek is, is doing Hegel by way of Lacan. And yeah. he's showing us. Um, hey, this is just this is just not like ontology. This is this is not just you know Abstract. breathless, big-headed ideas. Like this this operates in the material world, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you that by you know explaining this other guy who's hard as fuck to understand named Lacan. <laughs> okay, the yeah. logic of re mark the lesson to be drawn from what we have elaborated so far is that hegel is to be read carefully and literally mm. when for example he says that the hardest nut of the speculative approach is to recognize the identity of the contraries as contraries to uncover the positivity in the negative itself this does not mean that the contraries are to be somehow united, harmonized, against which we could always retort that this operation never works out without some remainder resisting synthesis. Or that the negative force is to be somehow inverted into positivity, encompassed by it, against which we could always retort that there is an excess of negativity resisting absorption and the positivity of the dialectically mediated identity. As we have seen apropos of the cunning of reason, the crucial gesture of the dialectical approach is to exhibit the positive enabling productive dimension that pertains to the negative as such to grasp how what appeared at first a purely negative and pending agency functions as a positive condition of possibility of the entity it impedes. The appropriateness of the current doxa on Hegel emerges most clearly at this point, apropos of the negative's inversion into positivity. The hardest nut for the non-dialectical approach is to reconcile it with the Hegelian affirmation of the infinite force of the negative. That is to say, it is not sufficient to conceive Hegel as the thinker of negativity, as the philosopher who displayed the bacchanalian dance of negativity, which sweeps away every positive substantial identity. What escapes such an approach is simply identity itself, the way identity is constituted through the reflexive self-relationship of the negative. We shall endeavor to shed light on this hardest nut by symptomatic impasse of the Deridian reading of Hegel. It would appear that the Deridian treatment of Hegel itself repeats the above mentioned paradoxical logic of the supplement elaborated by Derrida apropos of his model analysis of the role of writing in the Platonic text. First, writing is simply excluded as a secondary externality which does not affect the inner presence of the idea. Then, second, he is forced to acknowledge their uncanny proximity as if the inner essence is always already affected, constituted even by the process of writing, which is why we have to repeat the exclusion of writing at another level with an idea itself. Derrida and the Deridian interpreters 
Nancy Lacou Labart, gosh, likewise first opposed Hegel to Derrida by presenting him as a kind of effective antipode of Derrida. Hegelian dialectics is the culmination of the metaphysics of presence, the logical machine of notion which, by means of its self mediation, sublates and encompasses all hetero heterogeny, a closed circle of teleological movement within which every diversity is an advance posited as its own ideal moment. In contrast to Derrida, who affirms the irreducible dissemination of the process of difference, the impossibility of ever enclosing this process within the circle of self-mediated identity. Second, however, they acknowledge that it is almost impossible to distinguish the self-differentiation process of the notion from the movement of difference, that the line separating them is almost imperceptible, that their proximity is almost absolute. For this reason, their delimitation must be repeated and, as we have already pointed out, the form of this repetition uncannily resembles that of the fetishistic disavowal. The formula, je sais bien, mais quoi même, its first part articulates the knowledge which subverts the point of departure, Hegel as the philosopher of the metaphysical identity, and so on. Whereas the second part does not refute the first, it simply returns to the point of departure and clings to it as an article of faith. I know very well with that I know very well that with Hegel, any identity is just a passing moment in the process of difference. Yet for all that, I still believe that the speculative identity ultimately sublates all differences. <sighs> so that's really thick. Yeah, I got to say, um, my um, familiarity with Derrida is, is uh, almost zero so you know this is this is the part of the the chapter where i get a little i get a little lost um and it's difficult to parse if G, what at what point zizek is explicating the deridian conception of hegel and when he's trying to to summarize what his understanding of hegel is it gets a little muddy for me because i don't um i you know i don't i'm not familiar with derrida and his conception of of hegel um so i think i can i really i can only mostly ask questions in regard to this uh this section rather than pr really provide any uh exegesis <laughs> Right. Mm. I think uh, he's just pushing back on the characterization that, that Hegel or the mischaracterization of Hegel as, oh no, this flipped again. How did that happen? Oh, damn it. Hold on. My tablet got stuck like sideways. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm rereading this uh, short passage right, right here. That is to say, it is not sufficient to conceive Hegel as the thinker of negativity, as the philosopher who displayed the Bacchanalian dance of negativity, which sweeps away every positive substantial identity. What escapes such an approach is simply identity itself, 
the way identity is constituted through the reflexive self-relationship of the negative. So it seems to me that Zizek is saying that critics of Hegel conceive of him as being they conceive of of their of of identity and negativity as being opposites to each other rather than negativity being constitutive of a, of identity yeah and uh, again uh i i mean i think i like to go back to swiss cheese like the the voids are constitutive of, of its identity rather than uh something outside of or inconsequential or what like it's it it's all part of the all-encompassing process Uh, I know very well that with Hegel, any identity is just a passing moment in the process of difference. Yeah, for all that, I still believe that the speculative identity ultimately sublates all differences. Okay. Okay, so that reminds me of the beginning of the, of the chapter, the very beginning. Where it seems like Hegel's critics are saying, yes, Hegel allows for difference, but at the end of the day, it's simply a semblance of difference. It's not real, real, really real difference. He, he does, Hegel doesn't let the difference cook. Right. Um, because they're not accounting for the remainder. Yeah. And that, in Hegel, that is, that's constitutive of the whole. Yeah. The the with the I the remainder being being that gap, that void, um in the thing which which is the, the, which is the, the thing. That is the moment where the thing becomes the thing, is that yeah. We encounter perhaps the clearest example of this discord in Rodolf Gash's The Tain of the Mirror, in which the relationship of Derridian deconstruction to the philosophy of reflection is elaborated with immense theoretical erudition and acuteness. The first surprise, however, is the way Gash presents as specifically Derridian a whole series of propositions which sound as if they were taken from Hegel's logic. For example, on pages 201 through 202, any entity is what it is only. Any entity is what it is only by being divided by the other to which it refers in order to constitute itself. An almost literal quote from the beginning of Hegel's Logic of Essence. In order to maintain the distance between Hegel and Derrida, Gosh is thus forced to impute to Hegel a nonsensically simplified version of absolute idealism, summarizing the worn-out textbook platitudes on the dialectical one encompassing both the one and the manifold, and such like. Masters reach a peak when Gosh refutes Hegel by means of Hegel himself, presents as a limit supposed to escape Hegel the elementary propositions of a Hegelian logic itself as for example, in the following characteristic passage, the possibility, of, the possibility of dialectically comprehending the oppositions between what is doubled and its double as a relation of exteriorization and reappropriation of the double as the negative of what is doubled is logically dependent on the originary duplication according to which no on can refer in its appearing to it itself except by doubling itself in another i i just want to stop here so this is i think when in the first chapter when they were talking about the double inversion and the thing i had trouble with is that it implies that there is no originally 
uninverted, unalienated um, thing. And it seems like uh, this this Gash fellow is is essentially, you know, saying, uh, you know, an originary duplication according to which no one can refer in its appearing to itself except by except by doubling itself in an other. It seems like that's what Gash is more or less uh, referring to. Yeah, and I. Th- is the you know the double inversion yeah and for me it's the double inversion is the the doubling of that inversion is that that retroactive that moment of the identity forming in that gap so the initial inversion would be maybe the opening of the gap and then the doubling of that is when that that identity actual actualizes and comes to light. Yeah, okay, so okay, I I think I I think I have a little bit of a better understanding of it. So you can only get to the original uninverted thing through the double inversion and so the uninverted thing does not exist before that double inversion takes place it only exists in hindsight it only exists exactly after afterwards. exactly the the okay. retroactivity the and that's you know the the mole digging the holes it was there all along it's just that recognition um and it, i mean that's that's how i take it I, th- I think that retroactivity is kind of the key that that slides into the lock. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Because I ne- I never I never um, previously I didn't I didn't figure in the retroactivity into the the double inversion. But now now it it makes uh, now it makes sense a little bit. I better. think I think maybe like uh, like a thing like a platonic thing can exist uninverted um but that the fact the the universal particular the my phone versus the phoneness you know the ideal of a phone can exist uninverted but then the gap between the two is what allows this to have the identity of this is my phone yeah in short first one imputes to hegel an absurdly oversimplified notion of dialectical reflection reappropriation of the double as the negative of what is doubled subsequently one states as a condition of such a reappropriation supposed to escape the dialects the elementary dialectical insight that an entity can refer to itself only by doubling itself in another This inherent ambiguity of the deconstructive reading of Hegel emerges most violently apropos of the crucial notion of sublation, Aufhebung. In the first stage, Hegel and Derrida are, of course, clearly opposed. Aufhebung names the dialectical overcoming of differences, the very way notion encompasses heterogeneity, diversity, by transforming it into an ideal sublated moment of its own identity. Differences are recognized qua sublated qua moments of an oh, dude, of an articulated yeah. totality, whereas Derrida's entire emphasis is on an infrastructural remainder which resists sublation, which persists in its heterogeneity and is precisely as such as the limit of sublation as a rock on which sublation necessarily founders its positive condition. In a second stage, however, this opposition between Aufhebung and its leftover becomes blurred. When, for example, in dissemination, Derrida deals with the Mallarmian problematic of remark. He 
concedes that alpha bung as the elementary matrix of Hegelian speculative reflection is almost indistinguishable from the graphics of remark so that the gesture of differentiation has to be repeated in a far more refined and ambiguous way. This Derridian reading rewriting of the Mallarmian remark deserves closer examination since, as we shall see, it is here that Derrida comes closest to the Lacanian logic of the signifier. Is he pointing to this, like the symbolic order? Like, uh, maybe a again like the ideal like the <clears throat> yeah i um i I don't know. I, I, I you know, I'll, yeah. I'll be honest and, and reveal my, my lack. I am, uh, I'm stumped by uh, this paragraph. <laughs> um, because again, I'm, I'm, you know, I get a little bit confused between, okay, is, is Zizek, talking about his is 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 Zizek trying to say that is he trying to contrast or point out the similarities in this paragraph between Hegel and Derrida um well I, I yeah I, th I think he's I think he's contrasting um maybe the popular uh views of both and maybe illuminating the the differences but also bringing bringing in the uh the similarities um <sighs> well let's push on i think i think it might I think we should uh, at least, because I, I do have some, I feel like he, he's going to get into some Lacan on the end, end of this page and the next page. So I think we, we should at least push on to there and maybe we'll, uh, we'll call, we'll call it a day, uh, call it a day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> at, yeah. At least get a little bit more back on some solid ground and then. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's go out on a strong note. <laughs> Okay, uh, I can I can take yeah. over. Um, All right. How do we get from the mark, marque, to the remark? Why must every mark, every signifying trace be remarked? Derrida's point of departure is the differential character of the texture of marks. A mark is nothing but a trace, a sheaf of features that differentiates it from other marks in which this differentiality must be brought to its self-reference, in which every series of marks as semic bearers of meaning must contain an additional tropological movement by which the seam mark refers to what demarcates the marks, to the blanks between the marks that relate the different marks to each other. In short, in any series of marks, there is always at least one which functions as empty, asemic, that is to say, which remarks the differential space of the inscription of marks. It is only through the gesture of remarking that a mark becomes mark, since it is only the remark which opens and sustains the place of its inscription. Are we not thus in the midst of the logic of the signifier as elaborated by Jacqueline Miller? In his two short canonic writings, Suture and Matrix, and the second of which, he even uses the same terms as Derrida, the mark in the empty place of its inscription, sustained by an additional empty mark, and so on. Is not the elementary proposition of the logic of the signifier dismissed by Derrida in a short note 
remark in On Grammatology that every series of signifiers must contain a paradoxical, paradoxical surplus element which holds the place within the series of the very absence of the signifier. To resort to the formula, which has been part of the jargon for a long time, a signifier of the lack of the signifier. That is, that is to say, insofar as the order of the signifier is differential, the very difference between the signifier and its absence must be inscribed within it. And is, and is not this valence that is not just one among others, the Lacanian S1, master signifier, the asemic signifier without signified, always supplementing the chain of knowledge, S2, and thus enabling it. Moreover, is not the empty place represented by the remark, the Lacanian sujet bar, the subject of the signifier, so that this most elementary matrix already makes possible the inference of a Lacanian definition of the signifier as that which represents the subject for all other signifiers. Does not the remark represent the empty space of inscription for all other marks? And that that part, uh, I I was able to grasp um, what he was doing in terms of comparing Derrida and Lacan rather than Derrida and and Hegel. Um, And it, it seems it you know it seems very clear to me that Derrida is doing a lot of the same stuff that that Lacan um, was doing in terms of there's S one master signifier S two chain of knowledge and then the third thing being the subject which is nothing but an absence that that connects and gives um meaning or the possibility of of meaning to these signifiers yeah yeah uh it gives thingness to the things um and so al I allows for that thingness i Oh, the when he, he the mark and the remark and the mark of the mark and the <laughs> it everything stopped making sense for a second there it really like yeah because it, it was just, boom, just boom, the boom, boom, boom. repetition of the same over and over and over um but maybe it might be good to nail down okay um so this to nail down what are the analogous terms yes. so so the mark could be the uh, a mark is simply a signifier a signifier and is the remark the, the signified Sure, it is. Or the uh, the semic, the asemic is the asemic is an empty or a floating signifier. Okay, so that is either master signifier, or is it the subject? Um, remarks the remarks the differential space space of the inscription of marks. It is only through the gesture of remarking that a mark becomes a mark. So it is only through the gesture of remarking that a mark becomes a mark, since it is only the remark which opens and sustains the place of it, its inscription. So I'm, I'm taking that the, the mark is the signifier and there's simic an asymmic an asymmic mark is an empty signifier 
um, which could be, you know, anything filled in by the big other. Um, and then the remark is the... the remark is the double inversion or the process of that. Um, okay. On the, 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 on the second page, moreover, it's not the empty place represented by the remark, the Lacanian subjet bar. So okay, okay. the remark is, is, is split subject is, is the split subject. The asemic is the master signifier. Okay. Okay. That's, the chain okay. of knowledge is maybe the the is the semic. Okay. And it is not this valence that is not just one among others. The Lacanian is one of the master signifier, the semic signifier without signifying, always supplementing the chain of knowledge, and thus enabling it, or is. Okay. The remark does not the remark represent the empty space of inscription for all other marks. So that remark would be that sublation. No. I think of the, the remark or the bird subject as being the void, as being the gap. As okay, being yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the vessel, the vessel for which one signifier connects to another one. That uh, that gap, that meaningful gap, that's filled yeah. in. Okay. Man, that really. Threw me for a loop, just the mark, 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 mark. Yeah. <laughs> you felt like a mark for not understanding what the hell yeah, was going dude. on. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, you know, sometimes, you know, GJ can go from, you know, being, it can go from being, he can go from being so clear, you know, you feel like you're just shooting, you know, three pointers after, you know, three pointers, not even looking. You, you got it. And then, and Zizek comes in with this, you know, paragraph where you're like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know, but um, that's that's the fun of it. It's like a roller coaster, you know? Yeah. And then and then you have. He presents the opportunity for that, uh, that delayed, that retroactive coming into focus where you'll be walking down the road or, yep. or driving to work or talking to someone or, or whatever, you'll be going about your life as one does. And then you get those little moments of, oh, of Zizek yeah. clicking into place. And, and that, that's really cool. Yeah, man. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's where it's at. That's where the, the jouissance of, 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 of theory is. <laughs> yeah. That's where it is. And yeah, it's uh, yeah, it was it was great doing this uh, this afternoon, man. I'm glad we were able to to get this together because I feel like it's gonna make you know the lecture with Mikey even you know. Oh, even dude, more absolutely. Fruitful. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm definitely down to to do this again. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I want to I want to be able to do this as much as we can manage. Um, I sure. love. I love this, um, but it's made even better by having, um, you know, fellow travelers along with me while. For sure. Yeah. I mean, talking this stuff out is, you know, it really, 
you know, you're, you're, yeah, you'll happen along something that like, um, really makes things click when you're talking it aloud with another person. The truth is in, is in the symbolic, not in the imaginary, you know? Um, well, that's so. that, um, you know, you got to read it, you got to read something and then you have to, uh, read it and talk about it. And then you got to read it and write about it or, or vice versa. You got to read it and then read it and write about it and then read it and talk about it for you to really like come to terms with a thing. Yeah, it's, it takes, it takes, it takes work. It takes work, but it's, it's, it's worth it. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's great stuff. And, you know, yeah, let's, let's do this again, you know, next time, you know, we can, uh, hopefully get Max in the mix and see what, you know, this is like with, you know, a third, a third, yeah. uh, person. So, so I'm, if you don't mind, I was going to, uh, post this in the, in the forum yeah, where Dave, go for yeah, it. that'd yeah. be great. I do um, hope to encourage other people to to do do their own versions of this. Yeah, yeah, I, I you know, um, I, I you know, I think it'll, ha and I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's even better when you 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 have a when you do an exegetical reading with a, a group of people rather than just you know one one person doing it um, by themselves. I think having you know a few people in the mix makes makes it even better so yeah let's um let's definitely do this again man yep all right dude i'm gonna boogie woogie oogie and go do stuff thanks for sure take it easy all right man we'll see you soon see ya late